Hi, everybody. I'm Natalie Brunel. And thanks so much for checking out my show where I get to hear from the leading voices in Bitcoin, financial markets, political structures, philosophy, and more. Please make sure that you subscribe to my page and like this video so more people see it and so that you don't miss out on any new content. This podcast does not provide financial advice. It is for entertainment and educational purposes only. This show wouldn't be possible without support from my sponsors, First and foremost, Swan Bitcoin. Swan is where I do all of my Bitcoin purchases and I dollar cost average every single day with the lowest fees in the space. And I love Swan because it's a Bitcoin only company. Swan Studios produces my new show, Hard Money, covering the biggest news in Bitcoin and the global economy. It's like an orange pilled version of CNBC. So make sure to check that out on YouTube for all the biggest headlines because we are not afraid to question the mainstream narrative. And Swan is putting on the first and biggest West Coast Bitcoin only conference, Pacific Bitcoin. It'll be held November 10th and 11th in the LA area with prominent speakers like Lynn Alden and Preston Pish. I'm very excited to be the MC for the event alongside Peter McCormick and Stefan Lavera. So if you want to get your ticket with 20% off, use the code HODL at PacificBitcoin.com. All right, it's time for the show. I am super excited to do this interview from Bitcoin Amsterdam, and I am joined by two of my favorite voices in the space, Greg Foss, Jeff Booth. Thank you so much for doing this. No problem. What a great time to be here. Thanks for having us. All right, so let's talk macro. There's a lot to discuss. Let's start with the CPI print, the latest 8.2%. So we're not really, uh, we're not really deflating the way that the Federal Reserve wants yet, right? What do you guys think? Well, let's talk about the number first, which probably came in as expected. They were saying somewhere between 8 and 8.3. The problem is the core. Okay, so the core inflation was 6.6 uh, higher than they wanted. Stocks are down, risk assets are off. Mortgage rates in the U.S., 6.92%. I just glanced at that. Um, it's ugly. And it's exactly what we thought was going to happen, right? So bonds, U.S. 10-year bonds are down, yields are higher. Uh, we have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> the demand destruction that's coming um, could take down the entire system. And, and, and once you have a, once you have a, I don't think people recognize the risk of the counterparty risk of the system um, starting to collapse. Um, and I think the inflation's a problem. And the response to that inflation causing a credit collapse, global credit collapse, is what you're starting to see sovereign bonds starting to price in. Um, and that's just starting, but that is bound to get a lot worse. And so, so it, as we fling backwards and forwards and kind of flush people from side to side, you have a lot of pain, a lot of pain coming to the global economy. And I love, that, sorry to interrupt, but I love that word, counterparty risk, okay? So my experience in the uh, great financial crisis was exactly that, you know? Everybody scrambles to find what their exposure to Bear Stearns was. These are interbank, uh, uh, basically, exposures that, uh, you know, you never assume that one of these big institutions can go down, and then all of a sudden, hey, what is, what is my real exposure to Bear? What's my real exposure to Lehman? Well, we're seeing that right now. What's my real exposure to Credit Suisse? Mm -hmm. Counterparty risk is what brings down the system because when one fails, it causes a domino effect, right? It's you think you have insurance with this insurance provider and all of a sudden you don't and then you're naked on your position. That's why in the great financial crisis, they rescued AIG because if they didn't rescue AIG, Goldman Sachs, was down. Okay, so isn't it funny that Hank Paulson, who used to work at a, uh, at Goldman Sachs, organized the rescue of AIG? Right? But the, but the problem with doing that, and if you just follow that that math, is all you're doing is actually increasing the debt. You're you're socializing the losses. You're increasing the debt, and you're moving it up the stack. Correct. And where we are on the stack, there's nowhere higher for the debt to go. Mm -hmm. So it, once you're into sovereign debt that is government debt, there's nowhere higher for that to go. There's, so the, the, it, you turn into a spot where at some point they're gonna, you're gonna have to do yield curve control mm -hmm. and massive printing into inflation to be able to, uh, to, which makes the problem worse. Both sides, it's just an ugly situation. Both of you have talked extensively on various podcasts about something's gonna break and then that's gonna trigger the pivot. So why haven't things broken yet? 
I think they are, they're in the process right now, let's be honest. And you saw Yellen yesterday say, uh, you know, she's concerned about the liquidity in the treasury market. All of a sudden, she did an about face. Well, now, but they, they tend to suck and blow a lot, right? Like they, one guy is a bear, another guy is a dove, uh, you know, but here, here's what we have to remember. It's, it's not going to be the, the corporations are going to be trickled down. It's going to be because it'll start at the credit, at the sovereign level, and the risk will flow downhill the UK guilt crisis has had an immediate impact on US cre uh, collateralized loan obligations, CLO. So yeah. that's junk debt, junk debt is getting crushed in the United States because the pension plans in the UK needed to sell something. So they're selling collateralized loan obligations into the US market, causing contagion into the US because of the, the guilt problem. So all of these intertwined things, what you need to remember when it comes back Bitcoin, which we all love, has no counterparty risk. That's why it's such a beautiful instrument. You haven't purchased insurance from anybody. It is insurance, in my opinion, but it's not like it's outstanding with any company that can fail. Mm -hmm. So having spent my career in the credit markets, I, I see things unraveling. It's slowly, but su suddenly, well, right now, there are, it's not zombie companies we need to worry about, Nat. It's zombie banks, like a big bank like Credit Suisse or Deutsche Bank, mm -hmm. that kicks one last thing uphill. Imagine if Deutsche Bank fails, it has to be nationalized by Germany, and all of a sudden Germany isn't the sugar daddy of the EU anymore. Yep. I don't know. Not a zero probability, you know, not a 100% out, certain outcome, but certainly not a 0% chance outcome as well. So you have to plan against these risks all the time. Yeah, and I think if you just carry that forward and, and if you understand Bitcoin doesn't have counterparty risk um, and, and that's what makes it special, you have most people pricing what they think is safety from the system that is providing uncertainty. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that creates more and more risk as they're leaning into that system, driving more and more risk into the portfolio by, uh, by doing so. And, there's this, and, and they're pricing Bitcoin from that system. Mm -hmm. Whereas Bitcoin is a system that's actually repricing this entire system. All of the credit, all of this entire system is going to be repriced in bit, into Bitcoin over time. But people, because they're used to pricing Bitcoin through the system. Right. That's what I love about Jeff's argument. Yeah. Right? You can't me isn't that what you say? You can't measure a system. You can't measure a system from a system. From, from the faulty system. But, right? you, but, so. you're, but you're so used to doing it because yeah. that system is a reference code for everything else. That risk-free rate that right. we think is risk-free and it's not risk-free is, is the reference rate for housing, which we pre think of yeah. the system. It's for, for, our, for every way of the, the emergent thing we call society, the emergent complex <laughs> thing we call society and the way of life is priced from that system that's breaking down. So now can I add something yeah. when you said zombie company? So the definition of a zombie company is any corporation that can only cover, excuse me, it's interest expense one time or less, okay? Meaning it's EBITDA or it's a pre-tax cash flow only meets interest obligations one time. And that's about a triple C rated company. Conversely, a triple A rated company can cover its interest expense 10 times. Mm -hmm. So you can see when you can cover your interest expense 10 times, well, that's a pretty good quality credit. But if you're at one times, you're playing with fire. Yeah. Guess what the USA is? One times. So if the USA were rated as a corporation, triple C, that's wow. not a good thing. No. Now, they can print money, but you got to compare apples to apples at some point. But we're, we're, worse than that, it's the reference rate for all other currencies. Oh. So, so when, when that happens, when, when the only way out of the problem of the reference rate for all other currencies is to drive high rate of inflation for a long time in the US, what do you think happens to the rest of the world? Exactly, and, and, Tr and, trickle and, down. Yeah, and so, so what you're seeing is an, an unwind, and now that could take some time and a whole bunch yeah. of different events. I would say in, this, in the world we're, we're moving to, expect the unexpected. Let's talk a little bit about the idea of printing into high inflation because Jay Powell has tried to be so hawkish saying that he wants to get the, the target rate above core inflation, which is now only going up, right? So that's going to be very, very difficult when you have so much debt in the system. But if and when the pivot does happen and they do print, 
I don't envision a scenario where all of a sudden people are piling back into the tech stocks, the, the dream stocks, so to speak, and the S&P hits 6,000. We seem to be in a new cycle. Lynn Alden talked about this in her last newsletter of how we went from uh, growth to value. Do you see that as well? Like when, when the pivot happens, what does that look like and where does the printing go? Um, in, in my opinion, so let's first talk about Jay Powell thinks he can be Volcker. Mm -hmm. And he can't be Volcker because when I said the debt just moved, moved up the stack, Volcker had 30% uh, debt right. to GDP, right? And so when you have 130% debt to GDP, which and, is now, which is, right, a, yeah. which, which is now, and you're trying to uh, drive uh, interest rates up or having to drive interest rates down, create that. As the economy collapses, as unemployment moves up, out of that unemployment moving up, what do those people do that now don't have jobs? They lean on the state. But there's no, there's no way to pay those people more money. So they're, they're, all those people that are, are going to, they, they're not just going to be homeless tomorrow without services, and because and, and mm -hmm. so, that's the other option. Mm -hmm. Everybody just gets cut off and you protect um, and you reset the credit and that credit spiral collapses the entire system. So they have to come in with, with massive easing. And that's actually why, that, that's why typically central banks always get, get co-opted by the state. There is no independence in time because society wouldn't let, allow the independence. Mm -hmm. And so treasury comes in and says, or, or you vote, <laughs> people vote, to remove the independents because they're hurting so bad that they'll vote for anything for short-term uh, fix, which causes more pain. And so that's kind of where we are in the cycle. And unfortunately, that is coming with, whether it's yield control, whether it's helicopter money, whether it's fiscal stimulus, you can guarantee that at some point it's gonna get really bad. I think he, he's gonna hold the line for some time and it's gonna get worse in other countries first. But as they're, making the dollar stronger and selling their assets and making the dollar stronger, that means that their labor rates are going down in relation to the U.S. U.S. is the only buyer of the world. Mm -hmm. um, as all everything else sells off, uh, sells off, it means U.S. exports are not competitive mm -hmm. um, a, a, as a result, and it kind of breaks it for, further. And then they're going to come in with, with, with all of the stimulus. And, and let's be clear, though. They cannot not print. Okay, they're saying they're going to try QT, but the only the error term right now in the debt spiral that they are in right now is to print money. There's no other way out. So they're going to pretend they're not going to print, but I'm afraid the math is they have to, to print. The question is, when do they pivot from their inflation fighting, even targeting inflation from you know, they currently have a 2% a, a annualized inflation and they're targeting Fed funds to go to 45 to 5%. It's only at three and a quarter Fed funds and everything is breaking already. Yeah. So by the way, it, it, that, that, that rate, like if you it, it, bringing down inflation to that, uh, that rate wouldn't be enough to, to bring the debt under control. No, that is solved. Yeah, that is the, the grade 11 math, okay? Like I'm afraid you guys painted yourself into this yeah. corner, so. Okay, but what does it look like when the pivot happens and the printing starts again? Because I think a well, lot of people are wondering question, how yeah. will yeah how will the assets really be affected by that? So uh, I would just say that's actually why why pricing that whole thing from outside the system, whether whether the debt collapses and the debt collapse, and Bitcoin becomes a safety asset because of that, or when it prints and 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 Bitcoin is a beneficiary of that. Mm -hmm. I, I just look at what is the thing outside the system that that accrues the most value in this uh, in this system and transitions us to something more stable and long term uh, um, and, and long term. Where do I want to where do I want to spend my time building where the future is going? So, but in that in example, if you said in that example, houses would probably do well again. Um, they wouldn't do well like Bitcoin. But pe people will be people will will try to put deploy money into anything they think is safe mm -hmm. that they can get a return on from other from rents going up or something is so, something like that. So so housing could do uh, could do well again. Uh, uh, oil will do well. Yeah. Energy will do uh, commodities. Uh, commodities will do well. Anything scarce 
and it um, will will do well. Again, same same concept. Abundance of money creates scarcity everywhere else. Yeah. And so look for things that are scarce, that that that, that abundance and money has to race into. Um, uh, but the most scarce mm-hmm. is Bitcoin. And if I could add in the thing, did you notice that both outcomes that Jeff mentioned, because we don't know, both lead to Bitcoin, yep. right? All paths lead to Bitcoin. So don't overthink it. If the Fed doesn't pivot, global depression, own Bitcoin. If the Fed does pivot quickly, more debasing of the currency, mm-hmm. own Bitcoin. And, I like and, it. And, and, and inside that entire structure, you can imagine if you were um, if you were all in on risk, uh, on, on risk, if you were all in on something that was based on the Fed pivot and then that didn't happen, mm-hmm. you're wiped out. Right. And the other way. Right. And so, and, ex- and expect this to be volatile moving back and forth. And For what sure. people will think is, oh, I'm winning. And then they're going to get wiped out because they're going to lever into that win. Yeah. And they're going to get wiped out the other side. Mm-hmm. And then they're going to go ba- back and the other people are going to get wiped out. It's going to be very and expect the, the unexpected and it's it's amplified everywhere else in the world that's the sad part of it right yeah the implications in other countries the less privileged countries well it's really sad to see what's happened with the energy crisis here in europe i was talking to my uber driver here in the netherlands his energy bills went up five times yeah he's paying five times more per month and he's frustrated with the politicians he feels like he has no say and it really is interesting how it's turning into sort of you know the the plebs and, and the average people versus the elites. And that's really what I think this, this yeah. Bitcoin fight is, right? And, and f- let's just move back to 99% of people on the planet don't understand Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. Um, 99%, that means 99% of the people on the planet are living in this th- system and because of potentially status quo bias or, 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 or biasing an expert view or somebody they think is smarter, they're reinforcing that system. And, and, and making it stronger. And, and as they do it, they think there is a solve by a new person yep. who can blame other people. A political savior exactly. here. political savior. And it's not, a, that is impossible to solve. This is a math problem, as Greg, as Greg <laughs> says over and over. Um, and it's impossible to solve uh, from the system. But because society believes it's possible to solve uh, from a system, they will vote for more people in that system and they will divide society. And unfortunately, that's the thing that I just hate seeing that when you say the Uber driver or you say, yeah. the, the, we turn against one another when a system is this, this corrupt, we can feel it and we don't know what to do. Right. And we think somebody else can solve our problem. I saw a graph where the 1% the percentage ownership in the world of assets by the one percent versus the ninety nine percent, we are getting to a point where the one percent of the world owns more assets. Yeah. Than yeah. the other ninety nine. Yeah. You it's had that in crossed. your book. I had it in my book. Yeah. Well, that now I saw. And it's just gotten worse. Yeah. Um, and, and it's gotten worse because you could predict it was right. uh, it would would get worse out of the system. I think an important part, uh, just out of the conference, uh, a number of people asked this, and, and this was an insight for them that they hadn't hadn't contemplated. Because when you look at Bitcoin, people want to carry all the baggage from the existing system, mm-hmm. all their biases, into Bitcoin, and the system operates in reverse. So an ex- example of why inflation works is wages are sticky. And so inflation for most of society is wage deflation. Um, and so people get paid less in real terms. And I'll give you an example. When I was a lifeguard at 16 years old, I made $20 an hour as a lifeguard at 16 years old. No good, way. Good, good lifeguard. Yeah, it was but yeah. $20 an hour working in, in the summers as a, as, a, as a lifeguard pool instructor. Um, and, and my kids make $16 an hour now. That was in 1986 or something wow. like that. That's crazy. And so that same $20 is like $60, $65 an hour yeah. now. And, and so, so when, you have a, when you have kids today kind of not being able to pay their right. bills and figure out, okay, I have to live at home till I'm 45. Right. And, um, and it, it, that's why. Yeah. And, and, and we don't understand the consequences of, of making those decisions and destroying currency and destroying right. value for right. those people. And it has massive consequences that just build up and build up and build up. So, but the exact same thing, because wages are sticky, works in reverse too. 
And so if you had a, cur if you had a currency that was stable, that, that allowed n deflation to happen from technology, wages being sticky is a transfer of wealth back to the middle class and poor. Um, it just works in a Wouldn't that reverse. Be amazing? Yeah. Well, I don't want to get too dark here, but I know that I myself and probably people in my audience, they're just a little bit nervous about everything that's um, escalating with the war in Ukraine and the threat of possibly nuclear weapons being used. You both have children. I mean, do you worry about any of that? And how close are we? Like, are we on the brink of something potentially happening with both the energy crisis, currency wars that are ongoing, and really we're on the verge of economic collapse, it seems. I wrote my book to try to avoid that. that. I tried to bring that into light. And you know in, in the book there's a chapter called Us Versus Them. And that chapter, when I wrote the book, a lot of people talked about the book and said, it said oh, that wouldn't happen, right? And you can see that happening. You can see a prediction out of all of this that it does happen and it will happen. And, and, and war is a result of trying to reset an economic system. Is, that's typically uh, uh, what the end of long debt cycles um, do because you have to make the problem. You have to convince your population to go to war that it's not their fault, it's those other people's fault. And we vote for people who will do that because it's, easier, it's easier to put a face on that problem and say it's their fault rather than our, as we, and we want to believe that. So yes, the world is becoming more and more unstable and I think you have to, we talked about it before taping, um, even if there's a, a nuclear event it, that doesn't cascade into something worse um, and it can be contained, think about what that would do to the psyche of the nations. Think about what that would do to every city emptying, trying to find safety and every supermarket emptying, and if you think COVID was bad and people turn against each other to try to grab the last piece of toilet right. paper, think about that on steroids and be prepared now just in case. And don't, not that it's going to happen, but the probability is increasing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and what I would say is by understanding what you would do, you will have fire insurance. It's, it's in understanding what you would do in the case of a fire, how would you get out of your house? Yeah. You should probably do that the same. Right. And I hate spending time thinking about these things, but to understand, and then uh, the, to, I want to understand the worst case, I want to understand the probabilities increasing of where the world's going, and then build the future as fast as I can to build the positive, yeah. hopeful future. Right, the parallel yeah. system. Out. Well, I could just add, look, I couldn't say it any better than Jeff, but. I, this is the most nervous I've been since the great financial crisis when I sat in a risk chair and on, honestly saw the financial world collapsing, the same, the same smoldering of the financial plumbing is existing. So on the one hand, you have the potential for nuclear war, nuclear collapse. On the other hand, we have real risks for financial collapse, both of which we hope don't happen. Let's be clear but the probabilities, i.e. the risks, are increasing. You need to protect yourself against that. I mean, it's crazy the headlines that we see on a daily basis from you know, the gas pipeline sabotage to, I don't know if you saw uh, last week, the OPEC, you know, the manipulation potentially surrounding whether something's gonna happen ahead of the midterm so that the price of oil isn't too impacted to potentially allow for a, a certain party to remain in power. I mean, it's just so much manipulation. Expect the unexpected. It's the, this entire system is more and more fragile and that fr fragility is in, in, in the entire system. And as, you're, as it's hitting that end of days, could it still go on for some time? Yes, but uh, um, could it solve itself for a small time in a certain window? A whole bunch of different, uh, different options. Yes, but only by making the system more fra uh, fra fragile. So when I worked on the trading desk, one of our tech lines was risk happens fast, okay? Risk happens fast. I'm going to warn you. Risk is happening faster than it ever has I love right that. now. So risk is actually happening faster because of all the previous risks that have been kicked up to the highest level makes risk happen faster. The world's a riskier place, I'm afraid, because of the system we have lived in that continually socialized losses and pushed the responsibility to the highest level. Can you guys talk for a second about this idea of, you know, when the pandemic hit, we crashed, we printed all of this money right. 
just to come back down from that bubble already. I mean, the S&P 500 is about 100 points lower than the high before the pandemic printing oh, began. I didn't know that's that. Yeah, I mean, he, what, what, did, what, what was it all for? Well, Only I, to make the billionaires I, I richer? Like, no, I mean, no, because the billionaires still have exposure. That being said, some of them are great traders. Most of them probably still have the same exposure. I'm gonna let Jeff answer this, but you asked the question, perhaps rhetorically, I can't explain it. I absolutely can't explain it. It was a short-term solution. They printed $9 trillion globally. Yeah. And now all of a sudden they're turning off all the taps and pretending they weren't the cause of this problem. And some of the Fed officials sold near the top. Well, that's a different story. They, they don't know, though. That's actually just a system it, reinforcing a system. They don't know. So remember the, what people said at that time. It's not going to create inflation. No, no problem. We got this under control. So inflation is going to be transitory. Modern monetary, modern, monetary theorists. And, 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 and they've never sat in a risk chair. They've never built a business. They're making up models that are useless yeah. in the real world, completely useless in the real world, trying to understand human action, what people do with their model that makes no sense in the real world. And it then they breaks. get the Nobel Prize. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, like, I mean, I can't say it any other way, but, like, this is absolute clown world central. Yeah where they go around patting each other on the back. Like, great job, Ben. Great job. You were the original helicopter Ben. You made this policy, and now we're giving you the Nobel Prize? Yeah. I'm not saying this, but there's a guy named Cuppy, who's a great follow, a hedge fund guy. I know who he is. Friend of Mark Moss's. All right? I don't want to dox him too badly. He said, Powell, or sorry, Bernanke should be in prison. Like, I'm not saying that. I, I am saying that. I will vouch for the same thing. This is criminal behavior that is disgraceful for my children. All right, let's talk about Bitcoin 2023. That's right, plans are already underway for the biggest Bitcoin conference in the world. It's gonna be held in Miami next year, next May, and you can get your ticket with 10% off using the code HODL, H-O-D-L. This is gonna be an incredible event. It grows in size and scale every single year. Take a look at this video from last year where you can see amazing speakers like Michael Saylor, Jack Maulers, and the parties and events going on in Miami Beach are pretty amazing as well. Head to b.tc slash conference. Use the code HODL, H-O-D-L, for 10% off your tickets to both BTC 2023 and Bitcoin Amsterdam. I will see you there. And finally, I wanna thank my partner, Fold. Fold is the best Bitcoin rewards debit card and shopping app in the world. You can earn Bitcoin on everything you purchase with Fold's Bitcoin cashback debit card and win free Satoshis every day or even a whole Bitcoin by spinning the daily wheel and purchase rewards wheels. Fold app is one of the best ways for someone completely new to Bitcoin to enter the space and start earning and learning. You can head to foldapp.com slash Natalie for 5,000 sats when you sign up. All right, back to the show. He said, Powell, or sorry, Bernanke should be in prison. Like, I'm not saying that. I, I am saying that. I will vouch for the same thing. This is criminal behavior that is disgraceful for my children. But, but you just carry that on. In my book, I talked about the, the, the two years of Powell, or sorry, Bernanke quotes that said, right. leading up to 2008, that said, no problem, there's never yep. been, there's never subprime been, subprime well contained, well -contained. Mm -hmm. uh, there's never been a reduction in housing prices, uh, there, the economy is strong over and over and over as he carried on pol policies that then, and then he gets a Nobel Prize right. for bailing out the system that, create, that he created. <laughs> that he created. <laughs> well, Senator Cynthia Lummis on my podcast recently said that when she was in the House, Ben Bernanke was asked at a public hearing, at what point is our debt unsustainable? And his quote was, I don't know, but we're not there yet. And then she's heard subsequent Fed chairs say that. And it's like, at what point does the music stop playing? I mean, mm -hmm. and that, I guess, kind of begs the question. I'm curious your, your thoughts. We seem to have kicked the can down the road in, during times when people thought, no, this is the last one. This is the last QE. Yeah. We're not going to be able to do it anymore. What's the scenario in which we do muddle through this? So, so, so today, if the entire world says is, is going to stay on the U.S. reserve currency, if the entire, then what that means is U.S. could continue, essentially they're, they're, the rest of the world is financing the U.S. and the U.S., essentially giving vendor financing mm -hmm. to, the, to the U.S. and the U.S. Prints, prints money to trade in, in, in printed money. And that is a negative externality around the world. And if that keeps going and, it, and, you, and, and, and other countries are going to trade their hard assets for paper that's going to be devalued over time, 
forever. Like oil. Uh, for, like oil. So I'm going to trade my, the things that are valuable, valuable in my country. Around. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to trade my labor in my other country for, for paper that's worth a, a depreciating value for eternity then this could go on for a long time because it means the rest of the world's pain is the U.S.'s gain. But you, I wouldn't bet on that. I wouldn't bet on the rest Again, of the risk world. risk will happen yeah. faster, yeah. <laughs> but let's do the math for the whole world. Everyone says, how long can it go for the U.S.? Okay, I agree it can go more for the U.S., but it's the periphery nations that will fall down once. Because again, if you take the world as one system, the total debt of the world is 400 trillion versus GDP, which is 100 trillion. If you look at the whole world, all right, it's very simple. There will be catastrophes because of that math of the whole world. Can the USA still do it? Most likely, they will be the last. They're the best looking horse at the glue factory, but that's all they are, the best looking horse at the glue factory. But what ends up happening is now, so, so the 40s were like this, but the U.S. was the only so, uh, superpower, and they were in China's position kind of as a, as a manufacturer of the world uh, in, in that, uh, at that time. Today, uh, today, they're very different. For, if you added, today, information travels faster. Right? So learning happens faster. So people are more aware of a problem like this. There's more superpowers, and there's, more, there's nine nuclear nations today and growing, which is different than the 40s. So you could, in, in 40s, you can, and they could impose financial repression on their citizens, and their citizens didn't have a way out. Today, you can't, with Bitcoin, you can't impose financial repression. People have a way out of the system. And so just that alone, as people understand that, wait, I could play in the system and I could make it stronger, or I could just choose mm -hmm. to not have financial repression, and right. I could choose a different system. That's a big deal. And then as other nations understand, wait, I can attract those people. Um, and those people have money and economy, and we can build a new economy. It creates a game theory that that other nations are going to accept this. So, so again, this is just a long way of saying that on both events, Bitcoin, uh, on All both, uh, it, it, it 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 transitions this system into something new. On one of the panels that we listened to at Bitcoin Amsterdam, they were talking about the idea of the central bank that does adopt Bitcoin will have an advantage. So, in terms of the G7 countries, which one do you think? Will likely, you know, embrace Bitcoin because it would give a country like the United States a huge advantage. So, so I actually suspect that the United States um, will embrace this earlier, although maybe maybe not as publicly as a central bank uh, doing it, but but through the free market because um, it, it's already happening in Texas and in, in, in Florida and so, uh, in Wyoming, it, it's already happening and there's tons of business building onto the mining business uh, works. There's a lot of countries in, in Kenya, the amount of mining activity that's moving into there to chase uh, cheap, uh, cheap energy. So this is happening around the world, but if you, so we, we've talked about could it be Canada? We'd like it to be Canada, but I suspect we, it isn't But Canada. we don't have a Jason Lowry. Yeah. Okay, so here's a shout out for yeah. my, my buddy, Jason Lowry, He's who works for the yeah. uh, Space Force, US Space Force. Probably the only guy that is in the same league as Michael Saylor that I've met in the intelligence, uh, intelligence in terms of brain intelligence, right? Um, I've been lucky enough to become friendly with him. I uh, met him in Boston and he's confided in me some of the things that he's working on, which is amazing. Like, you're lucky. The United States is a great country, all right? The reason it's not gonna happen in Canada is because we just don't have the freedom anymore that the USA has. At least you guys have a constitution where freedom of speech is still, you know, the First Amendment, right? And uh, that's what you need, and that's Bitcoin. And the two things, in my opinion, dovetail nicely. Uh, but that being said, the USA is the bastion of capitalism still in the world. Mm -hmm. They know the risk. There's enough you, smart you, people. That, UK, UK, with what the UK is going through right now, UK could move to this faster just because of fair, what they're going through. Fair, I would, yeah. I would agree with that. But it won't, unfortunately, it won't be Canada because we just don't have the global heft. What we do have are people like Jeff that are trying to educate. 
Luckily, we meet great people in, at meetups like this in Amsterdam that, that take little pieces home. Mm -hmm. Once it happens, though, it'll be a game of, well, it'll be game theory. Just look at what's happening in, uh, in Central America with El Salvador. Mm -hmm. Those numbers are so exciting. If El Salvador had equity, they don't. But if they did, I'd be a huge buyer of the equity of El Salvador. But strangely enough, Jeff and I talked in the past about buying the bonds of El Salvador. It, it, effectively, the equity of El Salvador... We would have loved to have bought those bonds and know that we would get 100 cents on the dollar back. But then Bukele came in and scooped up a bunch of bonds. Brilliant financial risk management in the face of a world. They had their GDP grow at 10% on a $28 billion economy. That's not bad. That's $2.8 billion for the good guys. What do you hear in the press? Oh, they lost $50 million yeah. on their Bitcoin position. Excuse me. You lost 50 million but you just put 2.8 billion yeah. totally. on your top line revenues well and it's unrealized right i mean they haven't sold their bitcoin they're holding on to it like that that was the plan it's still so an that opportunity cost but that being said Nat, you got to understand right it's an order of magnitude higher for sure that, that, that's uh you know actually two or uh, you you said it the other day is it two orders or one order I mean, it doesn't matter the point is you're dealing with 2.8 billion yeah. versus 50 million and what does the new york times and krugman uh, report on and CNBC also yeah really just, disgraceful their bet is it paying off failed experiment reporting yeah start telling the truth okay so people in Central America are gonna adopt it and if we're not smart in Canada you know what my advice is learn Spanish <laughs> <laughs> well but it does speak to that idea of you know companies that are adopting Bitcoin as well mm -hmm. institutions they are sitting on losses right now, including MicroStrategy, right? That are unrealized. But that goes to speak to the importance of the fair accounting change mm -hmm. that just happened. Can you share for people that are, maybe aren't as familiar, how big of a deal is this for Bitcoin? What happened in the past is you had to write down as a loss your holding on Bitcoin. And you never got to write it up. You only could write it down, mm -hmm. okay? The, if in a case of a company like MicroStrategy, where Michael Saylor says he's going to hold it forever, yeah. it's actually irrelevant because you know, you don't, you're never going to crystallize your loss unless you sell it. But for new companies that have to report to shareholders that they're putting this risky, in their terms, risky asset on the books, what if your quarter is destroyed because you have to mark down the holding of a Bitcoin, which is a long-term asset marked to short term? Well, Let's look at, uh, be honest, the banks are exactly the opposite of that. The banks never mark down their holdings unless there's a default on the loans. If it hasn't defaulted, they keep it at 100 cents on the dollar. So I think it was, it, it's, it's fairer, uh, more fair accounting. I think it'll make it easier for, for other companies yeah, so to come Mike, in. Yeah, Michael Saylor could buy Bitcoin because he owned enough That's of correct. the share class. He owned, the board. He, owned like, the board. he owned the board. He could, he could, board, he could drive the control of that <laughs> because he had control of uh, the public company. In most cases, that type of rule would prevent a CEO from making that decision because they would be out if Bitcoin went down. That next quarter, they're gone. They flush um, their quarter. They flush their, their, yeah. their, their quarter, and and it's it, it's an unrealized loss, mm -hmm. but it, and it makes no difference to to shareholders. But if the accounting says you have to write it down, you have to write so it down. So it'll make it easier, so, definitely so, easier. So, yeah, so yeah, you could it. you you could expect a whole bunch more adoption by companies out of that that rule because it makes it easier to adopt it. Right. Yeah. Well, to start to wrap up, I want to talk a little bit more about banks because they have okay. such a cozy relationship with the government. We just saw last week Kanye West and his company basically being canceled by JP Morgan Chase. You experienced something similar in Canada with uh, frozen, you know, accounts because people donated to the to the trucking protests. I mean, how powerful are these institutions and is this censorship a great advertisement for Bitcoin? So yes, I don't know if people know it as well well yet, so, but people are waking up to it. When you centralize power to any centralized organization and you build your life on that centralized organization, you're subject to a rule change that is imposed on you. And that rule change could be anything. You saw it with PayPal, you're seeing it with, mm -hmm. with this. And so that centralization carries massive risks that we don't know. Centralized, same thing as building your entire business on Google and they change an algorithm and you're tired, or they say, your voice no longer matters. Yeah. What do you do? 
and so that, because that centralization, we don't see the risk building, and that we don't see that risk building, and then that control cha changes. Um, society is duped into yeah. something that then all of a sudden, all of the risk is sitting on, on a, 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 a castle built on the sand that just yeah. collapses, quicksand. Um, and so that's what's happening today. And you, can, you have to expect that this existing system has to drive more coercion and control. Mm -hmm. It has to remove individual rights and freedoms to survive. Mm -hmm. And so you could expect more and more of that as we cascade down, uh, uh, down this. And you can expect because the first part, oh, it's Kanye, it's okay, it's the truckers, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. A, it's, and that just moves up the stack and then all of right. a sudden it's you. Yeah. And, you, and, and when it's you, you feel, oh, how did that happen? Yeah, it's just crazy because basically they're they're picking and choosing. J.P. Morgan Chase kept the bank account of Jeffrey Epstein after he was convicted wow. of trafficking. I didn't know that. But yet, you know, you have someone who builds a billion dollar right. company and he has unconventional, controversial views. They shut it off, and then you see the hypocrisy. Also, Federal Reserve allows the bank Mellon Bank to have uh, to custody Bitcoin, but Caitlin, Caitlin Long yeah. was fighting for it and yeah. not allowed. It's like they're picking and choosing winners and losers, yeah. and that's not capitalism at all. Yeah. Well, if I could add, just because Jeff and I went through the thing with uh, the Canadian truckers, when I was in high school in the '80s, um, there was this thing called the Seal Hunt in Canada. Do you remember, and you're too young, but all the, uh, the students uh, would wear uh, a pin that showed uh, a seal on it, a baby seal, beautiful little animal, white coat. And there's uh, an entire population in Newfoundland, Canada that relied on the seal hunt to uh, feed their families, but they made fur coats out of it. And it was a controversial thing. The point I'm trying to make here is imagine if it was all those people that supported the seal, uh, stopped the seal hunt where they froze their bank accounts rather than Canadian truckers, okay? It, as Jeff and I say, it de your view of it depends on which side you fell on. Oh yeah, freeze the accounts of the Canadian truckers because I don't like them honking in, Can in, in Ottawa. But if you ever did it with a seal hunt of which I you know, wanted to stop, Black Lives Matter or, it, it, or something, or and, any and, and other. So thing. as soon as Jeff said, he said, as soon as it happens to you, then you will realize. As long as it's happening to other people, right. it's fine. So, you know, be careful, people, because this is the this is the censorship that is very dangerous, and and you have to you have to nip it in the bud. Well, I want to leave on a note of hope <clears throat> because one of my favorite things about this space. And just Bitcoin in general is how much hope it's given me right. and how it's introduced me to people who I think are the smartest, the most inspiring, and truly the most positive in terms of wanting the world to become a better place and right. fighting for it. Like right. you've mentioned this in your tweets before so many times, like this idea of fighting for the world that you envision, that you want to see, rather than you know bickering amongst ourselves about the problems in the current system. Like right. let's build the new one that we want to see that reinforces the positive values of collaboration and prosperity and abundance. So what's maybe your takeaway message? Um, we have so much chaos going on, but Bitcoin does provide us with this hope. Yeah, that is the takeaway. Um, what I'd say if, though is if 99% of the world doesn't see that, meet them where they are so they can see it. Because the more people that just walk across the bridge and start to understand, make the bridge bigger for everyone else. And what that actually is, what's inspiring about that is we all make a difference. We have no idea how that difference impacts other people and they build on top of our ideas, impacts somebody else who impacts somebody else. But we all make such a profound difference. And so if, we, if, you're, if you're yelling at an existing system, it, you're actually making that system stronger. Everything you're doing in that system is stronger. And if there's a new system that is actually can make, heal the world, bring hope, truth, abundance to the world, wouldn't you want that? And wouldn't you want to spend more time there? And it's easy. It's a, as easy as making a choice and then spending time in that system. Yeah. So I agree. So it's just a great community. Um, a shout out to the young kids that I've learned so much from. Um, you know, like a Dylan LeClaire, like you, Natalie. Um, I often say, uh, if I'm the smartest guy in a room, we better find another room. And so let's let's make sure that we continue to to meet young people. Uh, help them uh, be the future leaders. We need uh, more uh, 
uh, voices like yours. Uh, we, I just met at this trip, Amanda uh, Cavallari. Uh, just a just a wonderful person that I said to her when we were walking to this. I go, I feel like I've known you my whole life, mm-hmm. and yet we literally met each other two days ago, right? And so I don't know what attracts these people with the same uh, moral code and, and yeah. everything. But it's not Wall Street, I promise you that. Having spent my life on Wall Street, 99% of Wall Street are takers, okay? The flip side is at least 85% of the Bitcoin community are givers, and yeah, I'd rather be part of the giving community. Yeah. Um, I've come to meet both of you guys who I consider close friends right now, right? And um, But I'm not doing it because I want to be close friends. Like, I love being close friends with you guys. I'm doing it because I have three kids that really are in a, in a bad spot if we don't fight for, you know, the future. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And, you know, it's the holidays are coming up, the season of giving, and I just really think today, the most American thing that you could do is find someone you disagree with and have a real conversation and try to make some peace because there's too much craziness going on. And at least Bitcoin is something that can bring us together, I think. 100%. We meet people. I met uh, Nigel Farage today. I would never have met the man. Love him or hate him, I never would have had the chance to meet him if I wasn't part of the Bitcoin community, right? So, yeah. Well, I love you guys. Thank you so much for taking the time. Any final thoughts? No, thanks for having us again. It's 100%. So good to, yeah. Amsterdam is beautiful. Yeah. Keep up the great work that Natalie's doing. Young kids out there, invest in the future by meeting us on common ground to say, we might not be right, but we're just trying to do the right thing. So do, do well by doing good. It's, it's a great way to live your life. Oh, you know what, though? I'd actually just say, your story on you coming in the Bitcoin from the press and seeing an opportunity to do something that you love, that connected with your, your values, it's inspiring to watch your, you rise and, 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 uh, and, and, and be so inspiring for a whole bunch of other people. And it was just a choice you made to move to yeah. a, a world of hope and where the world was, was going. But, but actually inside that choice, what you see is, is what we think is safe, the old job being safe. <laughs> yeah which is actually cre- creating the most pain for people and they're right. stuck and they don't want to make the choice and that that choice provides incredible value mm-hmm. and it's just a frame of reference right and so so watching what's happened with your career and everything yeah. else out yeah. of this Agreed. it's i, I appreciate and it's, and, that and, and we're proud of you right because it's not easy to take that risk oh, on no no but I'm saying, <laughs> okay leah leah halpern everybody's you, turning off now well no no but here, here's what i just want then you got to edit this back in leah halpern who introduced me on stage at, at bitcoin um, amsterdam just a charming young lady i I happen to, you know, it's not the right thing for a guy to ask, but yeah, how old are you? Not because I wanted, I, I have a son who's actually a year older than her, and I'm like, oh my God, like it's, I, I'm. Why aren't you I, doing I'm, the son? But I'm so <laughs> lucky to have friends that are like my son's age, right? And, and that being said, I have lots of my son's friends who I'd like to think are friends of mine as well, but this is new friends from the Bitcoin community all working in the same direction. Yeah. There's a friend in the back here, Jack, that, honest to God, he's going to help change the world. And this is what I really am excited about. No, it's so fascinating how many different backgrounds, you know, we all come from. And I always said that I I think I was searching for Bitcoin. I didn't know it. I knew the values and the questions that I had. But I didn't know I was searching for Bitcoin. And then Bitcoin sort of found me. It found all of us. So thank you, guys. Thanks so much.